Daisy had never before understood the meaning of work, or tiredness, or tragedy. She sat in a school classroom drinking sweet English tea out of a cup with no saucer. She wore a steel helmet and rubber boots and an armband that read ARP. It was five o'clock in the afternoon and she was still weary from the night before. She was part of the Oldgate District Air Raid Precautions Sector. Theoretically, she worked an eight-hour shift, followed by eight hours on standby and eight hours off duty. In practice, she worked as long as the bombs continued to fall and there were wounded people to be taken to hospital. London was bombed every single night of October 1940. She heard a low hooting sound outside. Slowly it rose in pitch until it became the tiresomely familiar siren of an air raid warning. Seconds later there was the boom of a distant explosion. The warning was often late and indeed sometimes it sounded after the first bombs had fallen. The phone rang and Harry picked it up. George said wearily, don't the Germans ever take a ruddy day off? Harry put the phone down and said, Nutley Street. Mabel said, I know where that is. They all got to their feet and went outside. As Daisy put the ambulance in gear and drove off, Mabel sitting beside her said, happy days. Mabel was being ironic, but strangely, Daisy was happy. It was very odd, she thought, as she careered around a bend. Every night she saw terrible destruction, tragic bereavement and horribly maimed bodies. There was a good chance she herself would die in a blazing building tonight. Yet she felt wonderful. She was working and suffering for a cause greater than her own gratification. And paradoxically, that was better than pleasing herself. She was part of a group who would risk everything to help the wounded. And it was the best feeling in the world. Nutley Street was on fire. The Luftwaffe always began by dropping incendiary bombs. The fires they'd started served to guide later planes through the darkness to drop the more destructive high explosives. The ambulance screeched to a halt and they all got out and started work. People with minor injuries were helped to the nearest first aid station. Those more seriously hurt were driven to St Bart's Hospital. Daisy made one trip after another. When darkness fell, she switched on her headlights. They were masked with only a slit of light as part of the blackout, though it seemed a superfluous precaution when London was on fire like this. The bombing went on until dawn. In the daylight, the bombers were too vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire. As the cold grey light washed over the wreckage, Daisy returned to Nutley Street to find there were no more victims to be taken to hospital. She sat down wearily on the remains of a brick garden wall and took off her steel helmet. She was filthy dirty and worn out. I wonder what the girls in the Buffalo Yacht Club would think of me now, she thought. Someone said, would you like a cup of tea, my lovely? She recognised the accent as Welsh. She looked up to see an attractive middle-aged woman carrying a tray. Oh boy, that's what I need, she said, and helped herself. She was actually growing to like this beverage. It tasted foul, but it had a remarkable restorative effect. She watched the woman go round the little crowd of ARP wardens and firemen and neighbours. She must be a local dignitary, Daisy decided. She had an air of authority. Yet she was clearly a woman of the people and spoke to the men with easy warmth, making them smile. The woman took the last cup on the tray and came to sit beside Daisy. You sound American, she said pleasantly. Daisy nodded. I'm married to an Englishman, she said. I live in this street and I'm the Member of Parliament for Aldgate, the woman said. My name is Ethel Williams. Daisy's heart skipped a beat. This was Lloyd's mother. She shook hands. Daisy Fitzherbert. Ethel's eyebrows went up. Oh, she said, you're the Viscountess Aberowen. Daisy blushed and she lowered her voice. They don't know that in the ARP. Your secret is safe with me. Hesitantly, Daisy said, I knew your son, Lloyd. She could not help the tears that came to her eyes. He was a very kind man. Thank you, said Ethel, but don't talk as if he's dead. The reproof was mild, but Daisy felt she'd made a terrible faux pas. I'm dreadfully sorry, she said. He's only missing in action, I know. How frightfully stupid of me. But he's not missing any more, Ethel said. He escaped through Spain. He arrived home yesterday. Oh, my God! Daisy's heart was racing. Is he all right? 
perfectly. In fact, he looks very well, despite what he's been through. Where? Daisy swallowed. Where is he now? Why, he's here somewhere. Ethel looked around. Lloyd, she called. Daisy scanned the crowd wildly. Could it be true? A man in a ripped overcoat turned around and said, Yes, ma'am. Daisy stared at him. His face was bronzed by the sun, and he was as thin as a stick. But he looked, if anything, more attractive. Come here, said Ethel. Lloyd took a step forward, then saw Daisy. Suddenly his face was transformed. He smiled happily. Daisy, he said. Daisy sprang to her feet. Ethel said, Lloyd, there's someone here you might remember. Daisy could not restrain herself. She ran to Lloyd and threw herself into his arms. She hugged him. She looked into his eyes and kissed his cheeks and his nose and his chin and finally his mouth. I love you, Lloyd, she said madly. I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you too, Daisy, he said. Behind her, Daisy heard Ethel's wry voice. You do remember, I see.